Hello. Woo. Uh, <laughs> good evening. This is so fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to go ahead and get started. I think there's a little bit of um, a few people still coming in, but I like to start things on time. That's it, how I am. My students know that, so we're going to do it. Um, but they <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here. And welcome to the Many Voices Speech Symposium for this year, Survival Stories. Uh, my name is Amy Pearson, and I am an assistant professor of communication here at FECC. At the end of 2015, I was alone in Paris watching the film The Pursuit of Happiness, following the saddest news I have yet received in my lifetime. The passing of my very spunky, talented, and endearing Grams, whom I was incredibly close to. The film, if you've seen it, it's a good one, traces the journey of entrepreneur Chris Gardner's struggle through homelessness, bankruptcy, and the challenges associated with being a single father. As I watched Chris struggle to survive in his story, I was struck by his determination, creativity, and sheer willingness to show up in his very challenging everyday life. I was inspired by his story in that moment and thought to myself that maybe I could also make it through the loss of my dear one if I could also dedicate myself to showing up for the daily challenges of my own life. We all have stories and the sharing of our stories can work to make us feel less alone and even show us and others a way to move forward and through. Although we can't control what happens to us in our lives, we can control how we respond and what we do about it, with a little help from our friends. I'm proud to introduce you to some storytellers tonight. It takes a lot of courage to tell our stories, but it has the potential to change lives. As you listen, I hope you find yourself in the stories of others and that you are filled with the courage and fortitude to move forward in the daily challenge of your own life. First tonight, we will hear from distinguished FECC alumni and a dear friend of mine, Jesse Mayhew, who for the past five years has served as the executive director for Big Brothers Big Sisters in Flathead County and has recently moved to a position as assistant director for the foundation here at the college. After that, we will hear from eight FECC students from across disciplines who I'll introduce as we move through the program. You'll notice in your programs, you got your programs, you can look in there with me, a spot where you can place a vote for your top three favorites. So you've noticed pencils on your tables as well, so throughout the night as you go through and you kind of see your favorites, just mark by their name. And then at the end of the speeches tonight, my friend Artist and FEC student Luke Dowler will play some music for us here. And then at that time, we'll have volunteers come around and collect all of your programs, okay? And then we'll work to tally up the favorites of the night, and those three will receive uh, some funds from a foundation enhancement grant, okay? So make sure that you do um, get that ready to go so we can collect them quickly at the end of uh, the speeches, okay? Finally, I'd like to thank all of our speakers tonight for your courage and your stories. The foundation at FECC and the marketing department for your generosity and support. My mother for the delicious, and father and aunt for the delicious treats that are on your tables. They brought those over. Yeah, those are safe. You can eat those, they're good. <laughs> and each and every one of you for being here. So let's first welcome Jesse Mayhew to the stage with a round of applause. Come on up, Jess. This is going to be quite the evening. We are going to hear stories about survival. Survival in the midst of challenge, chaos, and uncertainty. We are very fortunate to be here tonight, and there is someone who put in a lot of time and energy into organizing this event and into convincing us all to be here. 
in addition to being an incredible professor, she is an artist, a writer, a musician, an actress, an author, and an all-around amazing human being. Would you join me in thanking Professor Amy Pearson for her incredible work here tonight? <laughs> it is not easy to talk about the hard times that we go through. It is very personal and perhaps a little risky because you don't know how people are going to take it. In fact, I'm not sure I'm actually going to do this. <laughs> but we do it. We do it because it brings us together, because we all have something in common. We all encounter hard times in this great adventure that we call life. I've been looking forward to tonight because we get to hear from eight FVCC students stepping far outside their comfort zones to share with us. It takes no small amount of courage, and I know that we are going to be inspired. Can we give a big hand to all the students that are going to share with us tonight? It was the winter of 2002, and I was attending FVCC, working on my associate degree. I had just completed an, an internship with our congressman in DC and was student body president here at FECC. I was working hard to find ways to make an impact on our community. I did an internship at the Salvation Army where I worked on a plan to start a youth center so young people would have a positive place to go. I wasn't sure what it was, but I knew in my heart that I was going to do something great that I was going to make a difference with my life. And then I woke up one morning in December of 2002 and I didn't feel well. It appeared that I had the flu, but I still went to class that day at FECC after a little vomit. After class, I drove home feeling nauseous, still thinking I was suffering from the flu. At that time, I was living with my parents to save money for school. Later that day, my mom came home from work and she found me unconscious on the floor. I had had a seizure. Eventually, the ambulance found our home and I was taken to the hospital. A couple days later, I was diagnosed with having a brain tumor. The doctors in Kalispell advised I go to the UW Medical Center in Seattle for surgery. A month later, I flew to Seattle with my parents on a flight provided by Semi-Tool on their company jet. About an hour after arriving, I had another grand mal seizure and was taken to the hospital. Had we not flown, the seizure would have taken place on the road somewhere between Seattle and Kalispell, which really would not have been ideal. So again, I was taken by amb ambulance to the hospital where I was able to stay and wait for surgery, which took place a couple days later. The tumor I had was called an oligodendroglioma and was located in the left frontal lobe, just anterior to Broca's area, a speech production area of the brain named after the French physician Paul Broca. Fast forwarding just a little bit, I returned to school and work and graduated from FECC in 2004. And I would like to note that I will be forever grateful for the great education and experience I had here. Somehow it was a good experience, even though I was having a bad experience. So thank you, FECC. Fast forwarding a bit more, I began attending the University of Montana, and then I had another surgery and radiation and chemo, et cetera, et cetera. I finished my bachelor's degree. I started my first nonprofit job at the Pavarello Center in Missoula. I earned my master's in public administration from the University of Montana, and I earned my master's in surviving cancer from the University of Adventurous Living. Before I go further, I want to say that I had good people in my life that helped me get through. My family and friends were incredible, and their support made it easy to believe in something bigger than myself.
My family and friends were incredible. But even with incredible support like that, sometimes our experiences can make us feel isolated, and I certainly felt that way. After going through surgery, radiation, and chemo, it was going to take some time for my brain to recover, to re create new pathways and new connections, which is a miraculous ability our brains have called neuroplasticity. While this recovery process was happening, I had the opportunity to experience some new challenges. One of these was I forgot how to have fun. It was just like that part of myself that experiences happiness and joy went missing. Another, I had temporary loss of the ability to make myself do things, or you could say discipline. It felt like writer's block had had a child with procrastination. <laughs> Another struggle that came my way was that it was hard for me to connect my thoughts to words and to speak them. The bright side is it's hard to be misunderstood if you can't speak in the first place. If you were reading an Oliver Sacks book, he would have told you what I was suffering from is called an expressa, expressive or Broca's aphasia. I remember a well-meaning doctor who said that that part of the brain the tumor was in wasn't really doing that much. And I remember pulling back what I really wanted to say, which was, that sounded like horseshit to me. <laughs> Another opportunity I had was dealing with a new profound sense of depression. I once heard someone describe brain cancer as a cancer of the soul, and I now understand how that can be true. It stretched my heart, it stretched my mind, it stretched my will, and it stretched my soul. But I survived. And I am happy to be alive and to be here tonight. So let's see, what did I learn from this experience? I certainly hope I learned something. Don't worry, I did. I learned to have patience and grace for myself and others. I learned that I have what it takes, and sometimes I need a little help. I have great empathy for others, and I learned that I can maintain a positive attitude even when things are pretty bad. Here are a few specific things that I think helped me a lot. I understood the importance of helping others. It is good to help others. It helps you to look outside yourself. And I did my best to put that extra empathy to work. Another thing is I tried to face my fears with action. I enrolled in Toastmasters, a public speaking club, to practice connecting those thoughts to words and speaking them out loud. I took a neuropsychology class to understand the battle that I was in. I studied like mad to speed the recovery of my brain. And I overcame. I overcame my desire to be self-sufficient and my fear of being vulnerable by going to see a counselor. Something else that I think has helped me along the way was I always try to surround myself with mentors with people I look up to who see the potential in me. I think it is always important to have a mentor and to try to be a mentor for someone else. In Paulo Coelho's book, The Alchemist, the character by the same name says, no matter what he or she does, every person on earth plays a central role in the history of the world. We are all in the midst of a great adventure. I still believe that I'm going to do something great. And I believe that you are going to do something great. Several years ago, I wrote a poem 
which I'm going to leave you with, about where I was and where I wanted to go. I am a writer without a book, a singer without a song. I just want to be someone. A writer writes and a singer sings. I just can't seem to find the means, but still remains a moving reason. I am the color of the changing season. Hello, okay, perfect. Okay, uh, I'm going to welcome our first speaker tonight. Her name is Haley Boysfurt, and her talk is called The Good Life. Haley is a running start student here at FECC and um, still in high school at Big Fork High School. Her favorite food is berry bowls. I don't really know what that is, but I, I've heard it's really good. <laughs> so Haley, come on up here, let's, let's clap for Haley. I think it is a truth universally acknowledged that when a person's time is up on this earth, they hope those that they left behind will say they lived a good life. A good life consists philosophically of being good, of being moral or ethical from society's standards. And while I think living a good life is something certainly noble to strive for, that is not what this speech is about. This speech is about what it means to live the good life. So what does it mean to live the good life? As a kid, everything makes you think you have the good life. Each play date with your friends, Halloween trick-or-treating, and Christmas opening gifts all make it seem like life could not get any better. But as you grow up, this good life changes from a childlike view to more of an adult view. Life gets more serious and more realistic than it was before. New traumas occur more often, and it can be hard trying to navigate through them. Basically, time and circumstance try to take the good life away. I have not been set up with the best good life odds. I have fought many battles, but the hardest one I have had to face was losing my father at the age of 15. But before I share that story, I have to go back in time so that I can clue you all in on why my father's death has led me to try to live the good life and why finding, embracing, and being present with love is the way to live the good life. Let us backtrack 12 years ago to when I was only five years old. I stood in the hospital room where my father had laid after he had fallen asleep behind the wheel. We did not know if he would make it, but he fought with everything in him. He had to relearn how to eat, walk, talk, and write, and that was frustrating for him. But he persevered, and he was always there for me as a father and a friend. My dad's accident made him want to live the better life. He started doing new things such as horseback riding as a part of his therapy, and I was so happy to have him for the time I did. He wanted to get better and be there as long as he could. We both cherished our time together knowing it had been a second chance for him. But we were not always together because I moved to Montana with my mom, stepdad, and two little sisters. I was away from all of my family in Pennsylvania, and it saddened me to be missing out on the many birthdays, weddings, and baby showers. It was hard to stay in contact with my family because of our busy and conflicting schedules, but I called when I could, and I would visit every summer I was able to. So... Fast forward to more recently, 10 years after my father, or two years ago, while I was here in Montana and he was in Pennsylvania, his good life was brought to a stop with a brain aneurysm. I went to school in cheer practice, unknowing of what had happened. As soon as I came home and I was told the news, it broke me more than anything in my entire life. It was the opposite of living the good life as I did not even understand what living meant anymore. 
I felt like I could not go on after suffering from such a hard loss, but what I did with that pain is one of the greatest things I could do for myself. Don't get me wrong, I miss him every single day, but he has helped me in ways that I never thought would be possible. His death taught me that even in my grief, allowing myself to love and embracing that love was okay, that I need to be present and enjoy this crazy life we all get the chance to be a part of. Living the good life is cherishing those around you and loving them. When you are around the people you love, you feel happier and more present. We are given one life to live, and to make it count, we must look deeper at ourselves. In Jamie Ducharme's 2018 article featured on Time, Five Ways Love is Good for Your Health, she lists five different ways love contributes to your overall health. These include making you happier, getting rid of stress, easing anxiety, it makes you take better care of yourself, and is even said to help you live longer. Each one of these love benefits that I just listed all tie into living the good life. Having less anxiety and stress can help you achieve a better life goal because you will be able to focus on yourself. Anxiety and stress cause the mind to wander and negatively affect your life. Living a life surrounded and overflowing with love contributes to a higher rate of happiness and can ultimately help you live longer. It is no surprise by being happy and around those you love would in turn produce a longer life than someone who is sulking and negative all the time. Also, taking better care of yourself is another large benefit to your life. If you are able to take care of and love yourself first, you will then be able to pour that love into others' lives who may need it. We are all able to make a change in someone else's life, but we choose if it is a negative or a positive one. From death came love and life. I cherish the time I am able to have with my family and friends because it is not to our knowledge when we will no longer be here. So we should make the time that we are here really, truly count. Even though trauma may be viewed as a bad thing, going through hard times makes you stronger. Growth is a part of life, and there are many things along the way that can affect your growth. Loss is looked at as something sad, and every day I think about how much I miss my dad, but nothing in this life is expected, so you have to roll with the punches and pick yourself back up if you fall down. This life may end, but love goes on and continues to grow in new people and new places. To live the good life, you must love those around you as much and as often as you can. Live in the moment and use your hardships as guidance to overcome future obstacles. I would now like to end with a poem by Rupi Carr in her 2015 book, Milk and Honey. What is stronger than the human heart, which shatters over and over and still lives? Thank you. Sorry, Haley, I forgot to show your slide. Well, this is Haley and her dad. Yeah. All right, so uh, our next speaker tonight is Mia Kelso. Mia is a first year student here at FECC. Her talk tonight is called Growing, and Mia's favorite things to do are to laugh and adventure. So let's welcome Mia up to the stage. Inside all of us is a little being, a little self, that has never really strayed too far away. That child inside is still a part of us. When I try to envision my little being, I see her with soft olive skin and bright green eyes filled with kind wishes for the world. But at times, she, I, was faced with the collateral damage that, com that came from the ones I call fi family, my mom, my dad, and my brother. For a long time, I repressed the little being that lives in me, not wanting to confront the things she went through. I went through, but at times, but at one point I realized that that is the only way I can truly heal. So I took her hand in mine, and we began to walk through the past happenings in my life.
It was when I was about four and my brother was two. that my dad made the decision to, to follow his addiction rather than the growth of his family. For a long time, his absence made the three of us, my mom, my brother, and I, grow much closer than I knew was even possible. Each morning was spent with the sun coming through the windows, kissing our, kissing our cheeks and lifting our eyelids as we spoke soft good mornings and even softer I love yous. My brother and I would tuck the worries of yesterday inside the wrinkles of our mama's skirt my fears would be held inside the little hands of my brother. These are my people, my tribe. This is all I needed. But as time went on, as time does, my mom became very wary. As many of you might know and might have experienced firsthand, it is a full-time job being a single mom. There is no second party to take the weight of raising children when parents are left to do it on their own. This task becomes extremely tiresome. What I think a lot of us forget is that moms are also human beings that have a life that asks to be noticed and cared for. It's the balance between being a single mom and remembering to care for oneself that becomes difficult to maintain. There was a long while where my mom maintained this balance with grace and beauty, but after a while it started to take a toll on her. She became wary and soon her struggle with alcohol dependency and her fight with severe, severe depression began. I remember for a long time, the only moment in the day where I could be with the mom I remembered was in the mornings before school when she would do my hair. Those were the times I could never seem to get enough of. Soon enough, this all started to affect my brother. When a boy is growing up, he needs a strong male leader in his life, someone that can teach him what it means and looks like to be a man. But because of my dad's absence and the lack of a father figure at all, my brother was left to fend for himself. Through the struggles of trying to make it through boyhood, he got lost, looking for lost intentions he couldn't seem to find at the bottoms of bottles or through the deep inhales of glass pipes. When there were no answers or directions found as to what comes next, he became very hostile. This hostility more often than not hiding the severe depression that seemed to always lurk in the center of his being. Having, such, having such unstable loved ones living in the home made walking home from school a guessing game I would oftentimes wonder if there would be screaming heard from the sidewalks outside and walls being punched by bruised knuckles and broken people, or would the home be quiet with a mother and boy laying on the hardwood floors, weeping, wondering what the point of living really was. And soon this began to take a toll on me. I remember many nights were spent on the bathroom floor, sitting crisscross applesauce, writing in my journal looking for answers as, how to, as to how I could save the lives of the ones I love most. But how could I save someone from drowning within themselves without starting to go under as well? The simple but very hard answer to understand is that I couldn't, but I tried anyway. There were many nights that I would lie with them as they cried, trying to show them that the pieces of their puzzles had just fallen out of place, and if they could just put them back together, then things might be okay. But they were in too deep. It wasn't puzzle pieces that had fallen apart. It was their hearts, and that is a delicate and messy thing to deal with. It got to the point where I couldn't lie on the floor anymore. Sometimes I couldn't even walk into the room, so I would just sit and weep for hours, wanting their pain to stop. Soon my fears became filled with shame. I felt ashamed of myself that I couldn't put them back together. Why didn't I have the answers? They have held my worries and my fears. Why can't I hold their pain? But soon those shameful questions started to become questions of blame. Why did it have to be like this? Did they choose this? I knew that they couldn't have. No one chooses to be so sad. Despite knowing this, I couldn't shake the feelings of the shame and blame. These feelings caused me, my little being, to retract and close myself off and become so untrusting and scared of anything and everything. But it wasn't long before I realized that I needed to learn to understand why it was that I felt this way. Why my little being felt as though she needed to hide so often. That was the beginning of the process. Years later, I sat in my counselor's office and that is where I first began to talk to my little self. <laughs> and realize that she is still very much a part of me, and she needs to be validated and heard. Being distant and detached had become my way to cope. That little being would run to her cupboard and hide, because that's all she knew how to do. It took a lot of time sitting in my counselor's office, letting my little self know that it was okay to meet with the world, and that I was sorry that all of those things had to happen. <laughs> But that, that was where, but that, I, but that I see and I understand 
It was one of the most freeing experiences when she took the first steps outside of that cupboard, when she started to open herself up to what this beautiful life offers. It felt like wings of freedom had been attached to my body. They don't last forever. That little being, me, still gets scared and runs to that cupboard for comfort. But I'm slowly learning that nothing comes from hiding. When we hide, we can't experience what it feels like to be truly vulnerable. Being vulnerable causes us to show up and to be fully present in everything that we do. Not to just be there, but to be raw and real in those moments and to be completely ourselves. It's beautiful to watch others do this, but to do this ourselves can be extremely difficult. It is a brave and courageous feat to be vulnerable in all that we do. I don't want to hide anymore. I want to take the hand of my little being always and show her, teach her how to be vulnerable, how to be truly alive. But doing this takes trust, takes time. So what I have learned in that little room of healing, that therapy room, is that I must take the, the hand of the little one that hurts, take the seeds of trauma that have been given to her even when she hadn't asked for them, and begin to plant them, begin to notice those parts, go over them over and over, water them, nurture them, and watch those seeds of trauma become beautiful lilies and daisies and poppies growing in the heart and mind of the little one that lives in me. Thank you. Wow, there are some pretty amazing writers and people in this room, if I do say so myself. <laughs> no bias. Okay, next we're going to hear from Gina Sullivan. Her talk is called Vi uh, Finding Voice, and Gina is a really talented knitter, uh, and that's something that she really enjoys doing, and uh, she's studying surge tech here at FECC. So let's welcome Gina to the stage. Hello. Survivor, patient, ready to learn, dependable. These are the words that I've heard people use to describe me as a person since I started coming to FECC nine years ago. I was a new mother going through a very messy divorce, and I started taking online classes in the year of 2010 in the fall so that I could be a full-time student and a full-time mother at the same time because my daughter had just been born in July. My marriage that had just ended was extremely abusive across the entire board. And I didn't sleep an entire wink the entire first week that my daughter was born. Because I was so worried that I would wake up and she wouldn't be there anymore. And I made the decision to leave because of that. I left in a very big hurry. He was passed out on the bedroom floor after drinking all night, and I called my mom and said I couldn't do it anymore. And she came and got me. And I made the decision that I really wanted to be a nurse because I've always loved helping people. And so I took the steps after I left to enroll here at the college. I took a full 18 credits that semester, and I continued to take 18 credits full time, including over the summer. And I graduated with my associate's degree in 2012. I applied for the nursing program that same year, and I was waitlisted because I needed to get work experience. And so I left school, and I took up a full-time CNA position, and I was raising my beautiful daughter, and I found out I was pregnant again. And so I gave birth to my son, who's back in the back there, Jackson, in September of 2013. And then I came back to school in spring of 2014, and I took additional classes because at that time, the college had the bridge program for nursing so I could get my LPN, wait, and then get my RN degree. And so it was, a, it was a little bit lighter of a load, but there were extremely long nights. Uh, there were days where I was running off two or three hours of sleep because I wanted my kids to know that mom was still there, but I had a full-time job and um, just making school work. It's, it's hard being a single parent because you don't want your kids to feel that you're absent because they're all you have, but you want to show them that there's a better life out there and it doesn't matter where you're at in your journey of life that it can happen. And um, 
in 2015, I reapplied for the nursing program, and I got in that year. And I'd given birth to my youngest son, Nathan, in February of that year. And I was so excited to come back to school. And my life fell apart. My second marriage ended because my ex-husband was a um, vet with a lot of problems that didn't want to admit the level of his depression. And he went off of his medication and kicked us out with no notice. My oldest um, was five that year, and she was going through so much, I ended up having to withdraw from the LPN program after two weeks because she couldn't handle going to school and mom going to school and all the changes that had happened. But I couldn't have asked for a better college because college made it like I was never here. I was able to keep all of my financial aid the bookstore made it work with the publishers to take all my books back after they'd been opened. And the business office really worked with me. So I left knowing that I'd be back eventually. And I didn't know when that would be. But I worked really hard. I had two full-time jobs. I was getting my daughter the help she needed. And I came back in the spring of 2017, which is when I had Amy as my interpersonal communication teacher. And I, there were quite a few classes I had to take over, and I couldn't have been more grateful for my anatomy and physiology teacher, Carla Ryan. She sat me down when I knew with that semester that I wasn't going to get the B I needed to apply for the nursing program because they'd made great changes. And she just sat me down and she was like, Gina, maybe nursing is something that's going to come later, but I really think you should check out the surgical tech program. And it blew my mind because I didn't even know what that program was until she introduced me to Patty Lincoln, who's now the director of the program. I literally switched my degree the next day because I knew that that program was for me. Uh, it gives me everything I need. And I'm so excited because I applied in 17, got some feedback, got waitlisted that year. But I applied again last year, and I got in. And I started this semester in the surgical technology program, and I'm working my butt off. <laughs> and we have about four weeks left of the semester, and I'm just trying to show not just myself, but other single parents out there that it's possible to do this, and it's possible to leave an abusive situation because there, is, there, there are people out there that you can find that can help support you, and I'm grateful for my mom because when I got kicked out of my house, she had a 500-square-foot studio apartment that she let three kids and another adult move into for three months. And I couldn't be more grateful for the college for having such a supportive community. Um, there's a lot of single parents here, and we're making it work. And I appreciate you guys for coming tonight. Thank you so much. Good job, Gina and everyone. Uh, next speaker up is Cheyenne Clark, and her talk is called The Unseen Umbrella. Cheyenne is double uh, studying social work and addiction counseling, and she loves Italian food. We should clap again. Why not? Come on. Hi. Thank you for coming. When you are a child, you are expected to act as a child with the love and directing hand of your parents, teaching you right and wrong, guiding you along the way to adulthood and independence. The shaping of who you are begins with your parental influence and gradually works towards peer influences and the social influences causing you to learn from your own mistakes and watching others around you make mistakes. You watch and you learn the good and the bad of people and their actions. What happens when you don't have that? Watching other children be children was the hardest thing for me to in my own childhood. Was there something wrong with me? Am I not normal? Are they not normal? What's going on here? I was told that everything was okay, that things were just temporary and that it would get better real soon. Wait, what was gonna get better real soon? All these kids having play dates and playing with baby dolls, their parents picking them up from school and taking them to basketball practice. While I am sitting here waiting for the next social worker to pick me up and take me into town to have a visit with my parents. 
When someone tells you that things are just temporary and you are only eight years old, you believe them thinking that it will be tomorrow or maybe even by the next weekend. You never expect temporary to be the next five and a half years of your life. Over the course of the five and a half years, I moved to six different foster homes, four of which were relatives and other two being families I had no idea who they were. I had no choice but to sit back and watch this ugly tug of war game going on between me and everyone around me. I was left to figure out all these feelings and thoughts on my own. Why don't I get to have a baby doll or play basketball? Truth is, I didn't get a childhood. My childhood was shrunk and shoved in a box somewhere to never be found. I was constantly moving around and having a visit with either my mom, dad, social worker, or my grandparents. There was no time to be a child. There was no time to learn by making my own mistakes. There was no time to live up to the expectation of being a child. I was this walking, talking adult eight-year-old that everyone lied to. It wasn't okay. I wasn't okay. My life was a dark, ugly cloud dragging across the sky slowly while everyone ran around me figuring out how to get it to stop raining without actually trying, hiding behind their umbrellas so they didn't actually have to deal with what was going on while I had no umbrella to hide under. I never imagined that I was that child, a child in foster care forgotten about by my parents as they struggled with their addictions. A child that wasn't a child anymore, I didn't have my parents to guide me through right and wrong. I didn't have their love to show me they cared about me. Why would my parents abandon me and not give me the life I was expect expected to have? <clears throat> they chose to love their drugs instead of their daughter. As I got older, I started to realize this was not temporary anymore. I was losing time to be a child I was never going to get the experience to enjoy being a kid with freedom and direction. For my 11th birthday, I was able to spend it with my mom at the Child Protective Service office. What I didn't know was this was my last visit with my mom. By the end of the visit, we both were in tears and heartbroken. We found out that I was <clears throat> being sent to Oregon the next day to live with my, my grandparents. I just spent the last three years in and out of visits, left day after day with no answer of what was happening or going on in my life. To all of a sudden it ending and moving away from everything I've always known to be my life. But moving to Oregon was probably the best thing that had ever happened to me. I realized my whole life was a lie my life was not meant to be a big, ugly cloud. I wasn't meant to not have a childhood. Even though my childhood was almost over, my grandparents made sure to give me the most of what they could to help me, to help show me what being a child was like. I never experienced this type of love and unconditional support <clears throat> in doing things that I didn't even know I liked or could even do. I was able to ride horses and show rabbits in the county fair I was captain on my volleyball team. I even got straight A's. To have unconditional love and dedication to you and things you want to do is amazing. I didn't know that I was capable of having a good life. I, I thought my life was broken. No one ever explained to me, so what else was I supposed to think? My grandparents showed me that lies can be broken and fixed even when they hurt us the most. That doesn't mean we have to act on what someone else did to us. We move forward and take what happened as a learning experience of what not to do. I am now mother of two very loving boys, one and six years old. I am attending Clyde Community College to obtain my LAC in general and social work. Things for me have not always been rainbows and butterflies, but I am bettering my life for myself and my children. I never want them to question where they belong or my love for them. That was a really sad and lonely place to be and I could never imagine doing that to my own children. Although I never had the real chance to make my own mistakes as a child and learn from them to shape me into who I am, I had to 
the gift to learn from others' mistakes to shape me into the strong, loving, caring person I am today. I would never go back in time and change the way I grew up. Realizing my childhood was a lie of who I was supposed to be was the best thing that could have happened in time. There is such thing as a good life, and I have the choice to live that good life. I don't have to be like my parents or live up to their bad name. I have taken my own time and strength to shape me into the best person I can be. I've taken the good from those who were good to me and held on to it deeply. I have watched the bad from the bad people around me all to motivate me to keep going every day. I will be that guiding hand from not just my children, but everyone around me. I am a fighter and I will always fight for myself, my children, and everyone around me. Thank you. Thank you, Cheyenne. Okay, our next speaker tonight is Christopher DeJohn, and his speech is called Love Yourself. I think I helped out with that title a little bit. You did. <laughs> Chris is studying theater here at FACC, and he loves Italian food, too. Who would have known? All right. It's Let's welcome him. It's Let popular. Yeah. I am youngest of five siblings. I have two older brothers and two older sisters. Growing up as a teenager, my older sister got married and my older brothers had also moved out on their own. That left my mom, dad, second oldest sister Linda, and myself. I was closer to Linda all my life. I looked up to her and admired her for everything that she had accomplished. Linda had a full-time job and saved enough money to buy herself a new car. Soon, she started dating her boyfriend, Steve, and that is where her life would change. It would be a good change in the beginning, but would soon become a nightmare for her and my family. When Linda became engaged to Steve, my mom and dad were not thrilled with the idea of them getting married. My parents knew that Steve was a bad influence on my sister. She was hanging out with Steve more often than with my family and myself. Linda could not wait to get married, so she and Steve eloped. Linda did not tell my parents where she was or that she had ran off to get married until she called my parents to tell them that she was okay. Once home, Linda and Steve rented an apartment that was adjacent to my uncle's house. Linda became pregnant with her first child. She stopped working and relied on Steve to take care of her emotionally and financially. Steve was on disability and he got a check from the state to live on. On the first day of every month, he would get his check, cash it, and spend most of it on alcohol. He was a violent alcoholic with a temper. He physically and mentally abused my sister, on one occasion, he punched Linda in the stomach while she was pregnant. The baby was fine and no internal damage had occurred. My parents thought that once my niece was born, Steve would change and stop drinking. He was sober for a short period of time, but he started drinking again. My sister became pregnant with her second child. Steve would binge drink every time he got paid or he found money to drink with. There were numerous times when my sister had tried to leave him. Almost every month, my parents and I would drive up to her apartment, but we could, and get her away from Steve. He was never around when she left him. There were a few times when he was there and he would beg and plead her not to leave him. Every time Linda would stay at my parents' house after leaving him, he would call my parents nonstop wanting to speak with her. He would even come down to their house to see her in person. One time my parents and I had driven to Texas to visit my older sister and her family. Linda was watching my parents' house for them the night we came home. Steve was on my parents' front lawn intoxicated. 
He was threatening to kill everyone there, including himself, if my sister did not come back home with him. My parents had to call the police and have Steve arrested. Linda continued to leave my brother-in-law and then proceed to go back. She even moved out of the city two hours away and she still went back. I was so angry and scared for her every time she did go back. Linda finally divorced Steve after he cheated on her. I am so thankful for Linda that she is safe and that she was doing much better without Steve in her life. Like Linda, I too have had my share of bad relationships. When I was 16, I realized I was gay. When I turned 21, I moved to Salt Lake City to attend technical school, which is where I first found my first boyfriend and I was in a relationship. Shortly after we started dating, I moved into his apartment with him. And one night after work, I came home to find a handwritten note from him on the front door stating that I had been evicted. He had changed the locks on the door. I had called him from a payphone and asked him why I was being evicted. He told me he could not talk about it and that I needed to come get my things. The next day, I had a police officer escort me to my apartment. All of my stuff was in the hallway. I took what I could and left. I told my boyfriend to either keep what I had not taken until I could get it or to do donate it to local charity. He told me he would keep my things for me until I could come get, until I could, <laughs> until I could come get them. On Monday, he called me at work and told me that I could come home and that he felt that I had learned my lesson over the weekend. To this day, I have never figured out or know what that lesson I was supposed to learn was supposed to be. I realized that he was a controlling person. I shortly moved out and back home afterwards to my parents' house. In 2016, I met a man online. I was living in Bozeman. He was living here in Whitefish. We spoke on the phone for a week and they decided to meet in Missoula for the weekend. Brian and I started dating long distance. I would drive to Whitefish every other weekend to see him. He being selfish came to Bozeman only one time in four months. When we did spend time together, Brian told me what to wear, how to act, and also tried to change who I was. Every time he called me, I had to answer the phone, no matter what I was doing. He ended up breaking up with me over a text message. I was devastated. I felt like my world and my life was over. Brian wanted to remain friends. I was hesitant, but was still in love with him and I would have done anything just to be with him. He convinced me to move to Whitefish. I, of course, moved here to be closer to him. Once I got here, he wanted to work things out. A few days later, Brian told me he didn't want to be with me in a relationship. I was devastated again. This is where I finally found a great guy, Irvin, who's here tonight, who I've been with for almost three years. Irvin has stood by my side even when I was still not over Brian. He could have left but chose not to. Instead, Irvin has shown me unconditional love. Love that has meaning and a purpose for good. The pain and hurt that I felt with Brian was so bad that I wanted to end my life. I checked myself into Pathways Treatment in Kalispell, where I was there for a week. I got the help that I needed. The message or lesson that I want you all to learn or gain out of this is to love yourself. First and foremost, love yourself. Do not, and do not let anyone tell you who you are supposed to be in order to please their ego or low self-esteem. None of us are perfect. I'm not perfect. The more communication we have with each other about how we feel, the better we all will feel. Our self-worth is more important than to please someone else who wants to change us. 
there is help out there for those of us who want or need it. I took the much needed help. My sister finally did as well. It is never too late. I'm going off script here because I do want to say that I've been in school now for three years. Um, I put myself through my first year on my own, paying for my own tuition. Uh, I'm actually, hopefully, fingers crossed, in the process of graduating in August with my associate's degree. And I would like to continue on to get my bachelor's degree where I would like to teach theater. Um, FVCC has changed my life. It, it saved my life. I mean, if I didn't have the school to come to every day to learn and to improve on my education, I don't know what I would do or where I would be right now. Um, so I thank the college for that. If you do need to get help, Pathways Treatment Center has a local number, which is 406 five, or sorry, 756 3950. And you can also go on to their website, which is www.rehab.com. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Chris. All right, next on the list is Kelsey Burns. Her talk tonight is called New Beginnings. Kelsey is a first year student here in the Welding and Technology program, and she loves to make art. I believe she made that uh, drawing on her slide, right? Oh, no, never mind. She didn't do that. Um, but she does make lovely art, <laughs> and uh, she likes to eat chicken. So let's welcome Kelsey to the stage. Uh, thank you all for coming and taking the time to listen to what we have to say because uh, without somebody to listen, the meaning is lost behind their stories. So I appreciate it. Um, everybody's story has a beginning, and like so many, mine started with a pretty rough childhood. Being genetically predisposed to bipolar depression stacked the deck from day one. Making simple day-to-day -day life difficult starting from a small child. As I grew older, bipolar depression turned into depression and anxiety, making it hard not only to connect with my parents, but create healthy relationships with people around me. On top of my own struggles, my sister, who is now 25, has smith formley opitz syndrome. Essentially, she wasn't born with enough cholesterol in her for, uh, to promote b brain and body growth. Although she is high functioning on, this, on the spectrum, it was trying to deal with both m me and my sister at the same time. As a result, I was put into the system at a very young age. When I was nine, it started with foster care, which turned into group homes, out-of-state prep schools, and eventually juvenile detention centers, until I finally made it back home at 14, where things were good, but inevitably not for long. Instead of dealing with the animosity, I, I swept it under the rug, thinking that if I didn't acknowledge it, it didn't exist. As an adolescent, I didn't understand the reasoning behind pawning me off onto somebody else. And on the surface, it seemed like out of lack of love and nurture. So, subconsciously, this led to constant self-sabotage. Although I had struggled with depression for a long time, between the ages of 14 and 16 were the hardest for me when traumatizing events had shaped the next few years of my life. Without alternate outlets for ang the anger I had and nobody to talk to, I began, I began self-harming. Ultimately, I tried to take my own life overdosing on a bottle of yellow pills on my, grandpa on my grandparents' bathroom floor. Blinded by, the, by agony and affliction, I didn't see anything left for me. Growing up, love in our household was something that was known and understood and not spoken. Affection wasn't shown and the only emotions ever expressed were disappointment. This taught me that perception is everything. In my opinion, this is what sent me into the arms of, of a toxic boy at 14 with a, a false sense of love and security, blinding me to the, re to the reality of what love really is for the next six years of my life. Introducing drugs, instability, and chaos into my already damaged life was just the beginning of a whole new set of struggles. Sadly, to only have a violent and unhealthy ending. When I was 16, I got emancipated. 
and left home. Struggling with the motivation to focus on the future, I dropped out of high school my junior year at 17 and was homeless for so quite some time. At that point, I hadn't talked to my parents for what seemed like an eternity, and I had no desire to change that. I felt like no matter what I did, it wouldn't be, ever be good enough. I continued to get in trouble with the law until my probation officer gave me a choice. Either it was jail or another group home until I could support myself and get back on my feet. That was many, one of many do or die moments for me, my very last chance. I struggled for months, but over, ultimately overcame the demons I was facing. I got a job, an apartment, and started mending a very broken relationship with my parents. I came to realize that your childhood and the things that happen to you aren't your story and what defines you. It's what you make of it. Getting over a painful experience is much like crossing the monkey bars. You have to let go at some point in order to move on. I was told time and time again, by the age I am now, I'd be dead, homeless, or in prison. And here I am, 21 years old, living life I never thought I'd, I had never imagined. And it's just the start of my new beginning. March of last year, I finished my high set. After many sleepless nights, stressing that I was going to fail, I was one out of three students in my class to score college and career ready in all five tests. Up until last September, I never in a million years considered going to college. I laughed when they asked me if I was going to at the graduation. <laughs> And now I'm currently getting my associate's degree for welding and technology and hoping to get an engineering degree after that. As, I, as the knowledge I gain expands my horizons and opportunities, I get more excited about what the future holds. I'm now closer to my parents than most people are, going from not knowing if I was, if I was going to decide to be here tomorrow to planning the next five to 10 years of my life is unexplainably fulfilling. My free time, I've been spending a lot of time with my dad in his shop learning. His ultimate goal for me is to be able to run his water jet and fabrication business, H2O Cutting Service, and I couldn't be more grateful. Sadly, this is the storyline to many people's childhood. Every, but every kid is one caring adult away from a whole different life. It took me a long time to see that there's life ap after adolescence, and I know it's part of my journey to help others, other children and young adults see that to pay it forward. We are de destined for greatness in life, and life is the journey to find that out, to find out what that is. Thank you for listening. All right, thanks, Kelsey. Next is Journey Armstrong, and Journey's talk is Deadly Paradise, and she's a second year theater student she uh, likes to, she's really good at sewing. She makes a lot of beautiful costumes for the theatrical productions. So Journey, welcome. Clap. Clap. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name's Journey Armstrong, like he said. Um, I'm 19 years old and this is my survival story with my cute little teddy bear. I was born and raised in Bozeman, Montana and when I was 15 years old, my dad took a job in Hawaii. And it was there that I lived, worked, and played for about a year until I started to get sick. I had a variety of unpleasant symptoms, but the most annoying was that my abdomen started to swell up. I started visiting doctors in Hawaii where I had scans at the hospital, and I even saw a naturopath. But not nothing was showing up. I decided to move back to Montana and live with my grandma, and I started seeing doctors in Montana in December of 2016. Still, nothing showed up, but I was starting to get worse. In the summer of 2017, I started school at FECC. I remember my mom asking me if I wanted to wait until I was better before I started school. To her, I replied, no. I have no idea what's going to happen to me, and I don't want to just be doing nothing while I wait to maybe get better. So I began. I spent my time during summer experience mostly in bed. By this time, my sickness had progressed to the point where I had so much abdomen pain, I could barely move. I also could not eat without a great deal of pain. My parents bought a house close to the college so I could live at home, and I remember getting out of bed, going to my class, and coming back home to lay down. To this date, I have seen 20 different types of doctors, including six naturopathic doctors. I have also traveled to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, where I was diagnosed with fructose malabsorption, and to Kansas City, Kansas, where I saw an oncologist, because something in my body was causing my mast cells to overactivate. 
I have been to the emergency room three times because my face, hands, and feet would randomly swell to the point where I could barely move. I have had two colonoscopies, two endoscopies, multiple CT scans, tons of blood tests, bone marrow biopsy, and many, many more tests, all of which came back normal. The <laughs> I know. <laughs> the doctors were baffled. Multiple doctors indicated that my symptoms must be in my head just because they could not figure out what was wrong. I started losing hope and every day was a struggle to survive. I was in excruciating pain, I could not eat, and I could barely function. I will spare you the details of all of my symptoms, but there were many and they were horrible. I started a pattern of going to school all day without food and only eating out of a ne necessity when I got home and was able to immediately get in bed where I would lay in pain until the next morning. I threw myself into sewing to take my mind off of my pain, and I was the costume designer for three plays here at FECC. I also worked one summer at the Big Fork Summer Playhouse as a stitcher. That summer, I had to live at home because I was just too sick, and I made myself a bed in the back of my car, and on breaks while everyone, everyone was going out to eat, I just slept in my car. There were days where I sewed laying down on my stomach on the floor of the costume shop because I was in so much pain I could not stand. I was not doing well mentally or physically during this time, but I was determined to make it through. Meanwhile, during this time, my mother had been researching my illness and setting up doctor's appointments for two years. She told me that she would not give up until I was better, and she never did. My dad was supporting us from his job out of town. He was also paying all of my doctor bills and making all of the arrangements for me to travel to specialists. He even drove all the way from Billings to Kansas City to be there with me. I had tried every diet known to man, but nothing helped. At one point, my mother was running all over town buying all of the turnips because we thought that was the only food I could eat without pain. <laughs> Eventually, I realized that my sickness had nothing to do with food. It was something else. There was something brewing in my body, something eating me from the inside out, and I felt like I was going to die. Finally, my mom thought she found the link, the link that put everything together. All of my symptoms matched. Could this be? My mom found the right doctor to answer all of our questions, and amazingly, the doctor was in Montana. Finally, after two and a half years of a living nightmare, I had a diagnosis. I had been slowly being poisoned to death by toxic mold. My diagnosis was confirmed by 19 vials of blood, a nasal swab, a vision test, and a urine test. These tests showed that I have two genetic markers, making it impossible for my body to clear toxic mold on my own. That puts me in the only 24% of the world's population who cannot. For most people, getting out of a moldy environment is enough for their bodies to begin to heal. But for me, even after we left Hawaii, the toxins in my body just kept circulating and circulating, causing widespread inflammation and tissue damage to my entire body and all of my internal organs. The nasal swab showed I have a colony of bacteria growing in my nasal passages from mold, which explains why I was beginning to feel I could not breathe. My eyes have been affected to the point where I fail vision tests and I cannot tolerate the sun. My digestive system has been severely damaged and swells anytime I eat. I have chronic inflammation throughout my body causing widespread pain. However, I am still alive. And it is because of my faith in Jesus Christ that I did not take my life during this time even though I was beginning to turn to self-harm to cope with my pain. There were many times that I had lost all hope of ever getting better, but I know that many people were praying for me and Jesus was with me through it all. I want to thank all of my teachers here at FECC because every one of them was understanding and helped me work around my illness and all of the school that I missed, because I missed a lot. I was given many opportunities at FECC, which gave me something to focus on during an otherwise horrible time in my life. I was also offered scholarships which really helped me because my parents were and still are paying my medical bills because I was just too sick to work. I would not have been able to complete college without all of the help I was offered. I also wanna say thank you specifically to the few doctors that believed me. I have realized that believing someone is important and even if most of these doctors were not the ones who eventually cured me, their belief gave me strength. So thank you for believing me. I'm on a regiment now to clear the toxins from my body. I've been told that it might take six months to a year for me to feel completely better, but I have hope. I'm also hoping that by sharing my story, I might provide hope for somebody else. I would like to end with a Bible verse that became my favorite throughout all of this because it was through this trial where I learned where my strength really comes from. 2 Corinthians 12.10, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, 
in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Thank you. Thanks, Journey. Our last speaker tonight is uh, Colleen Summers. I'll get her slide pulled up here. And Colleen is a second year student here at FECC, and she is a history major. Uh, Colleen is almost done. She also likes Italian food. Really? We should, all, we should have some pasta or something on those tables, too. <laughs> Mom, next year. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> all right, last beer of the night. Let's welcome Colleen. Here we go. Hello? Okay. My first suicide attempt was when I was 11 years old. My father told me to. When I was 12, he threw me against the wall so hard, he broke three of my ribs. From the moment my mom was pregnant with my youngest sister, up until the time of their divorce when I was 13, it was my responsibility to stand in the way and take not only the beatings that were for me, but also the beatings that were for her and for my sisters. In all honesty, I didn't expect to live long enough to be 18, much less 49. And it's really easy for people who are, have that kind of a background to end up living that background as an adult. However, I made a choice. I was not going to be a victim. And that was going to end with me. And it doesn't really matter what's at the end of that word victim whether it's abuse, whether it's cancer, whether it's a natural disaster. It could even be your daughter's cat peeing on the hoodie that you just spent $60 on and never got a chance to wear. You're just victim, period. We're not going to do it. And the question is, how do you do it and why? Because the truth of the matter is, my circumstances don't define who I am. The past abuse doesn't define me. My OCD doesn't define me my anxiety disorder, even my scars. They might be a part of who I am, but they do not define me. I define me, just like you define you, regardless of what circumstances you're going through. So what's the trick? How do we get over it? How do we overcome whatever it is that we are dealing with? Well, what we need to do is we need to allow ourselves time to heal. Now, physically, that's easy to do. We know what it looks like, but emotionally, how do we heal from bad things or horrible circumstances? Well, the first thing we need to do is acknowledge what it is that we're feeling inside. Don't lie about how you're feeling. Acknowledge it. And then find a healthy way to express it. You know, go out in the woods. Scream at God. He has really, really big shoulders. He can handle one person yelling at him. And he's pretty forgiving, too, from what I understand. So you'll be forgiven if you start yelling at him. Write journal. I do a lot of journaling. And that's a healthy way to express what's being felt inside. So after we acknowledge, the next thing is evaluate what took place. And in evaluating, the first thing you want to ask yourself is, what did I do right? Because every one of us has done right things, even in bad situations. And then you ask, what can I do different in the future? Now, notice I did not say, what did I do wrong or what did you do wrong? Because we're not here to beat ourselves up. We're here to strengthen and heal. So what can we do different for next time? Because if the situation's an earthquake, what's to say there isn't going to be another one? So we need to know how to prepare and be better able to handle any crisis that happens in the future. So we've acknowledged our feelings. We've evaluated and now, if there's any way we can get help, you need to reach out for it, whether it's a counselor, whether it's Alcoholics Anonymous, if it's a suicide support group. There's people out there who want to help. And as you grow and you get stronger, 
you know you're healing when you're able to start reaching out and you're the one who's giving the help and not just receiving it. It's actually one of the best ways to tell whether or not healing has taken place. Now, what do you do once you're healed? What do I do once I'm healed? Well, it's pretty simple. We live life. We take risks. We step out of our comfort zones. We actually make mistakes. In all honesty, mistakes is the easiest way to learn and remember how to fix things in the future. I mean, I can tell you from my Spanish class, I will never forget what empezar means again, even though I spaced it on the test. I will always remember until the day I die. There's nothing wrong with stepping out of your comfort zone. In fact, it's necessary for a really good, healthy, wholesome life. Now, I'm going to end this by telling you of a time when I really stepped out of my comfort zone last May. And we're not talking like just standing on a stage speaking or wearing heels, which I do once every 10 years, maybe. I actually told someone how I really felt about him, just out of the blue. And honestly, I did not expect him to be happy. But here we are in April. And my job now is to remind him of how lucky he is to have me in his life. Although, between you and me, I'm actually the lucky one. So what I'm asking and challenging everyone in here to do is to go out there and live and enjoy life. We are going to all have hard times. Bad things are going to happen. But life's a roller coaster. And I'll tell you those dips just makes the ride when things are better all that more enjoyable and healthy and just wonderful. So let me ask, who's ready to go out there and live? Thank you. All right, well, that concludes our speeches for the evening. So mark in your program your top three faves, and we are going to be around to collect those from you. And Luke Dowler is going to come up and play us some tunes. All right, here we go. <laughs> 